So um, we would have ended last by talking about the need for measuring performance. If I can just blow this up a bit. And um, we, we did mention that there are two main means of measuring performance. You have active and reactive means of measuring performance. The active would have been, um, well, I have my book, but it's closed. But I suppose if you have the page, you can look for the page. The active would have been, it's right on this slide. The active would have been inspections, right? I'm saying it like this because inspections is kind of more common, right? Inspections. Um, is towards sampling as well as auditing. Active is whatever you do that is good for the company. It seems to be something that is positive. And um, from last week, I think Rouhani had mentioned that active is what we call in Trinidad um, leading indicators, right? The leading indicators of health and safety. Let me just add two people in again. That may have been two that didn't get through before. It, it is actually in the FISA. I think Buran would have gotten through, right? Um, yeah, right, I think I'm seeing him there. So hopefully she can get through, but uh, we are recording, so she can get the rest of it, right? All right, yeah, so I'm saying um, for those who just joined us that uh, remember just two sessions you made and then you have your Saturday life back, whatever is left of um, what we do on a Saturday anyway now do, right? So. Um, so in terms of active monitoring, you have those there, the four that I mentioned, and reactive would have been anything that is negative, but the company has to record it, right? And for those of us who are in safety, and if you are not, um, what this really means, it is what I said is that it has to be recorded. They normally use like a spreadsheet. The uh, active indicators normally go to the top of the street, and then when you finish off those active like surveys towards sampling inspection, um, you then record the reactive indicators, right? The accidents, the number of reportable events. Riddle means uh, this is a law for reporting injuries, diseases, and dangerous occurrences. Number of civil claims you have, and all of these here would have been uh, reactive indicators, right? Um, if um, I think from last week I mentioned that you need to know more reactive indicators than active. Um, so you have, if you look at this, you're going to see way more reactive, right? Number of accidents, number of first aid, number of lost time, um, high number of accident rates, et cetera, right? So you can pull them from this slide. Um, I'm re really trying to avoid going to the book because it slows me down a bit, right? So you follow through. I had mentioned those page last week anyway. Right, um, so this I'll explain, this is just saying that you need to measure both type of um, indicators, both what has happened before, like the reactive, indicate, the reactive indicators, for example, like an accident rate, and you also need to measure the active stuff, like how many inspections you are doing for the month, how many surveys, how many audits, et cetera, right? Um, so all of these, you're not to get lost by it, all of these are reactive. You can just look at it and know that accident, accident ratios, accident rates, all of these are reactive. We have the definition of accident here. I'm not too sure if we did this already, but um, there is no emphasis on memory then. So I, I don't think they would ask you what is an accident. For those who do not know, most people would understand it to be anything that is undesired. Is yes. I think in Trinidad, when you're talking about the, um, the reactive, or the lagging indicators. They talk about um, LTIs and days away from work. Yes. Yeah, yeah. And they have like certain acronyms that they use for the measurements. And it's a little bit different to what's in this course, but normally yeah. those are the things that they say in Trinidad when they talk about their statistics. Yeah. They're required to put like, DAFW, I think it is, and LGIs and yeah, um, yeah, yeah. medical yeah. treatments and stuff like that. Yeah, yeah true, it's, a little, it's a little different, but I guess. Yeah. Um, so, yes, yeah, yeah, so feel free to use those in exams. Like if you, um, if they ask you for eight, remember you can, the exam is an open book or should we say open PowerPoint? So you can use from here. But yeah, days away from work, um, DAF. W, yeah, days away from work. Um, if you're using any local acronym, they'll just make sure and give the full meaning of them. For example, like um, days away from work is one, 
And there is also, I think another one we say in Trinidad, um, restricted work cases, right? So yeah, feel free to use them. Um, um, the LTIs. But, yeah, yeah, right. So you can feel free to use them. Um, just make sure and give, give the full definition of them anyway, right? So the LTI is what light duty or something. I'm not quite sure of that of that acronym. Lost time incident. Right. Okay. Lost time incident. So it, it, it may be better just to say lost time incident. Um, yeah. Because remember, this these things are going to the UK. We have none to do with the marking of uh, any of these. So if you're using any local term like um, that. Lost time injuries, um, there is restricted work cases they use at Atlantic LNG. Just make sure and say them, but yeah, but nothing is wrong with them. They are totally correct, right? So I was saying yeah, an accident is anything that is undesired and the outcome is never good, right? I do not think they are going to bring a definition for you. If you look at the outcome of an accident, it is never good. You often have ill health, injury, damage to property, you get the rest, right? It's not for me to read them, really. Um, and I don't think they'll ever bring a definition for you all, right? Um, this is all about uh, the need for reporting and recording accidents. And um, the idea behind reporting and recording is that you want to find the cause. You'll see it here, right? So um, you need to establish a way of re recording accident incidents data so that the data could be analyzed. And one of the ways is the KPI sheet. You wanna find the trends, like when you record that every month, I'll try to draw one in a bit, but um, when I mean draw one, draw up a KPI record in a bit for those who may not know what I mean by record, but from the, um, from the data, like for January, February, March, April, some people would construct a graph and they can see a trend. And I guess even if you didn't have a graph, you can see if your number of accidents was decreasing for the month or increasing. And then from that, you can you know, use the data there to do a full accident investigation to find the cause of the um, the cause of what you know would have been the reactive indicator, right? None of these you have to learn. Um, the, the thing about these shapes that you're seeing coming up now, these these here, none of these you have to learn. Remember, it is an open book exam, right? So let, let me just go back. But none of these that remember, you can use your power, but none of these are stuff to learn. These are just uh, principles and health and safety. What they are saying here, um, first, but first of all, I started the beginning, right? That this is a triangle, right? Obviously, this, this is a triangle. And uh, what they have found is that um, a triangle is a good shape to represent safety figures then, right? You know, like um, in some, I guess, fields, a pie chart may have been better, but what they have found with safety and safety related, um, you know, uh, indicators is that a triangle is better because normally if you collect uh, near miss data, near miss data is like um, uh, what we call, you know, like the, the incidents then, right? Nothing really happened with a near miss. What they have found is that you normally get more near misses than minor injuries. Then you get more minor injuries than major injuries. And then you get you know, more of that than fatality. So what they have found is that when you put these, or when you plot these figures then, the base then, the base here is much, much wider than the top. So in terms of like a pie chart, um, they, they have really said that the triangle is better because the base of the triangle is actually so, so I guess broader than the apex. And um, this, this has been, I guess, the preferred shape for representing safety data. Also, what they say is that if you, um, if you record these near misses and you are able to investigate the near misses here, what you can do is prevent a minor injury, and then by investigating the minor injury, you prevent the major injury, and then by investigating that as well, you can prevent a fatality, right? So um, none of these really is exam material. It's just that um, it's just that you have to appreciate the the, the concept that um, a triangle is one of the better means of representing safety data, right? Um, so the same thing here, if you represent safety data or you collect them, in fact, you're obviously gonna find that there are, that there are more non-injury 
accident. So they represent this by 189. Now these are really constant figures that was worked on many years ago. Um, then you have less minor injuries and then you may have less major injuries, right? So um, really prior to the pandemic, students would have had to like draw and label these things, but not anymore. So please do not, um, do not, you know, waste your time learning them. Um, today, all we have is the principle behind it, which is an accident triangle or well, accident data is better shown in a triangle. Why? Because the shape of the triangle sort of fulfills how the data will be displayed then in that you normally have more near misses and less uh, fatalities or less minor injuries and major injuries, right? So. I'm not too sure how, how I'm coming across because my camera is sticking all the time, but maybe like I said, the voice is coming across okay, right? Um, uh, so types of accident rates, there are some uh, formulas we have in the field of health and safety. We have accident frequency rate, number of lost time accidents divided by the number of person hours worked by 100,000. Um, accident incident rate, number of work-related injuries divided by the average number of persons employed times a constant. And I really see a constant here because this constant can, can change, right? I know that's kind of weird to say that a constant can change, but that is how it is in safety, right? That thousand there can go up to a hundred thousand, it can go up to ten thousand. Um, what dictates that change though is the number of persons you have employed, right? So um, uh, very huge companies then uh, with thousands of workers, sort of like more than a thousand, if it's more than a thousand, they would have to change this constant here to 10,000. Now, again, none of these are really certificate level information, um, or should I say, um, examiner, but then no, right? I mean, these are normally examined at the degree level, but the second formula you're seeing here is very common in Trinidad. This one to the bottom here, accident incident rate. This is something that um, the STO, S-T-O-W, STO requires companies to do, <clears throat> that they have to calculate something called your accident incident rate, right? So it's very simple. Um, like if anyone was to come then it, it would be that but then again it's open book so you can just look at the formula um they would probably give you let's say they had two related injuries so they just take two you divide it by if they tell you that there was uh 10 persons employed so two divided by 10 and you multiply by a constant that they may tell you right now it is really hardly ever 1000 it is actually more going to be a hundred thousand, but I suppose um, that may be hinted to in the studies, but none of these have come before. And that's what I'm saying that I'm sort of making that up. These are really the old, um, the old format of the question in which though they would have really tested the second formula, right? At least like I said, the beauty about the open book and the, um, the four points is that you have them there, right? What are the limitations to relying on reactive monitoring data? There is a lot of limitations to it. Um, just let me go back and show you the triangle and maybe we could try to figure out some, right? What are the limitations then on, you know, like waiting for something to go wrong and then trying to fix it, right? So of course I think that in itself is something wrong, right? So like, uh, I suppose what is one of the major limitations with working with reactive data is that, um, I suppose the first one there, I'll give you about three, is that harm has resulted already. You know, other than being proactive then, if you are waiting to record these figures, how many near misses you have and minor injuries, I mean, God forbid a fatality, uh, the, the first thing that's wrong there is that, you know, someone has been injured or some property has been damaged already. So one of the major limitations is that they have already been some harm then or some damage, right? Um, so another one is this here. And those of us who work in the companies, you'll know about this one. I'm still trying to get my cursor and thing to move. Eh? So that's why... Uh, 
what is happening is happening here, right? So, um, yeah, so um, one of the main limitations if you record near miss information is that one of the things you know is that not everybody records it, right? Remember, a near miss is an accident that did not happen, right? It is sort of like someone slipped, but they did not fall, right? Um, a hammer fell from a scaffold, but no one was injured. So what I'm saying is that um, you may think you actually get 600, but who knows if on a construction site that is way more than 600 near misses, what you know about is probably what the safety saw or what was recorded, but what about the person who was working, you know, like uh, to the back of the compound and they slipped or a drill bit broke off and struck them, but, you know, maybe they had on the safety glasses, it did not um, cause any injury to their eye and they did not record it. They looked around, they realized no one was there because for recording, it may mean that they would be under investigation, right? Uh, at least they safety investigation. So one of the, uh, the serious limitations is that near misses are not always reported. Even if you give incentives and, you know, um, store requires incentives and rewards and stuff, someone then that slips in the car park, right? And if they have a busy day in front of them, the accountant or the technician, they would not report that, right? But that was a near miss. So one of the main limitations is that near misses are not reported as we think they should be. You only see those that someone take the effort to actually write about, but you know, those, um, those ground floor safety workers, um, if the safety is not a wrong or supervisor is not a wrong, they will just keep working as is, right? So near misses are seriously underreported. And just one more there, a bigger limitation of near miss data is, um, Sometimes near miss data, I would go forward now with this slide because I want to show you near miss data sometimes do not consider like um, part time employees. If you look at this formula here, then right number of work related injuries divided by the number of persons employed. But what if you had um, trainees and uh, persons who are working part-time and part-time here could actually be contractors, right? So like when, when you put figures into a formula then, average number of persons employed, sometimes the companies, they kind of keep the figures low, like they would actually remove then the contractors because the contractors may not be fully employed by the company. They are there doing a job and if one of their employees was the one that was injured, there are some companies that would not put that here because to them, that person is not working for them, right? So there's a lot of stuff that can go wrong with these formulas and, um, you know, uh, thinking about part-timers and contractors, et cetera. Sometimes they are not included in the formulas. So like you'd end up finding that the Accident incident rate is low, but then, you know, uh, workers may tell you that they had, you know, X, Y, and Z occurrences, but then those things are not recorded because the workers then, or the contractors, sorry, are not really employees of, you know, whatever company it is, right? So those are some of the limitations of using these sort of data. I think the main one is that, um, you know, the harm has resulted already. So, you know, it's kind of a little bit too late, but of course, um, we, we can investigate to find the cause to prevent it from happening again, right? So in terms of active, so when you get some time, um, you can check your books. Um, like I said, I have mine right here, but I don't want to go to the pages as yet. Um, um, try to look at the book and then the slide and try to come up with 10 reactive. Reactive is anything that is bad, right, for the company. And you have all in the slide there. So a high number of accidents, high number of complaints, high number of days away from work, high number of civil action, high number of environmental spills. That's five already, right? And so you have them on the slides. If you want to make them up, fine. If you don't want to make them up, just look at the book or look at the slides and you have them there. Also, I mentioned, um, I guess, um, I was thinking about if to say this because I know this is a recording. I'll probably say it at the end, right? When when I stop the recording, right? So 
I'll kind of leave that there. Um, so let's move on to this slide. So the types of um, active monitoring, I mentioned they have uh, five, and I know you may not have seen the fifth one, but the fifth one is like in the other chapter. I, I suppose it's there in your book. The fifth one, this one, which, which we call the fifth one here is actually auditing. So there are five main types of active monitoring on your syllabus. You have inspections, sampling, surveys, tours, auditing. Auditing is in lesson 13, the PowerPoint that we sent for you all this week, right? Now, um, again, if you want, let me just do some explanation here because you see, it's not about remembering. It's about, um, it's about just using the information that you have, right? So what I wanna do, let me just go back and I wanna show you something here. Um, what they normally ask here, um, they normally ask questions on audits and inspections. There are few or no questions on sampling surveys and tours. So when I said few, I had to think way back there, right? There, there was probably one tour question many years ago. So keep this in the back of your mind. Most of the questions are on audits and inspections. And uh, let me tell you what some of those questions are. So you can just write it down. So we have a focus then on what we're doing because like I said, to, to explain everything with an open book exam, especially when it's a definition, if, if I turn this slide in, this is a definition that anybody could just go and write over. Um, also, they are not really accent definitions. So it would be worthwhile to kind of focus on what is coming for exam then as opposed to just dealing with content, right? So um, one of the questions they like is like, what are the differences between an audit and an inspection? What are the differences? I think your book may actually focus on that. Let me try to pull it now. What are the differences between an audit and an inspection? And the other question in that is often things like um, the different types of audits they have. Right, so like internal or external audits would be the other type of question. So again, if you wanted to, I could have just told you the differences, but let's um let's see if we can scheme through something in the book a little bit. So if you have your book, you'll see like on page six, page five of chapter four, they have these little paragraphs there, and like what is an audit, and that's what I have on my slide. I'm saying you don't have to remember it because if the accident differences, you can just try to read it and pull out the differences. When you look at page uh, five, is it? You're gonna see little paragraphs on, same thing I have on this slide, there's a little paragraph on audit, there's one on inspection, there will be one on survey when you turn the page, safety sampling, right? Very small paragraphs anyway, safety tours, right? Um, so, I guess what I'm saying is that you all could read that on your own, you know what I mean? And see what that was all about, right? And we can focus on sort of like the real question then, which would have been, um, what are the differences between an audit and an inspection, right? So what we can do, let's read this slide on audit here, and I'll read this slide on inspection. And then um, I was hoping that they would have given you, some books give you like a table, like a comparative difference between the two but I'm not seeing that here, right? So, um, you know, we, we could give it like that, like sort of like a table, and on one side you have audits and the other side you have inspections. That, but let me read through this first, right? So an audit is a systematic approach towards identifying the strength and weaknesses of an organization, health and safety management system. An audit is normally conducted annually. It includes a full investigation through the organization of really all the company documents. So I have any health and safety policy, policies, procedures, safe systems of work risk assessment, right? So let me, let me go back to the definition. So an audit is systematic. What that means, it's in order, right? Systematic means um, the audit then is not going to just, you know, um, check, procedures, vikey vike as we say in Trinidad, but the, but the order then is an order. So like the first thing they would look at 
some of you would know is the health and safety policy. All right, literally the first question out of an audit is, do you have a health and safety policy? So it's systematic. It will look at the strengths and weaknesses of the organization safety management system. And the thing about an audit is that um, for those who know coming out of the audit, they, whatever doesn't line up, they call it a non-conformance. Um, the results of a safety audit is not, you know, to say that they're going to report it to OSHA, the result of a safety audit is to find those weaknesses and have you remedy them then, right? It's to find the weaknesses and to get the points for improvement. And all of us, if anyone here would have been audited, um, I guess the first thing I'll tell you, I mean, if you're in a company that has been audited, the first thing I'll tell you is that it is not nice, right? Being the subject of an audit is not nice um, because I guess no one normally likes for another person then to like show up your weaknesses, right? So it's not nice, but um, you know, if you take it in the positive sense, meaning that like the weaknesses they find, you can remedy them, right? Then that is the correct mindset of an audit. But um, companies who go to audits or, or even the word audit itself is something that people are afraid of anyway, right? So what you should know is that um, audits are done annually and they say we will discuss audit in more details next week, but that will be just now, right? That will be lesson 13. In fact, I would have to do it in this lesson one time anyway. That was lesson 13, right? The inspections is also systematic. It's, um, this may not be totally true. They say it's more in-depth study of all health and safety aspects within a specific area of the workplace. So I agree to that one. An inspection is also systematic, meaning that you go through with a plan, like what you're going to inspect. You can think of this, if you are having trouble understanding this, you can think of this like, um, uh, someone inspecting a vehicle, right? Or perhaps let's say a forklift, someone inspecting the forklift. Why I mentioned forklift? Because it's specific, right? Whereas like a, an audit is holistic. If we go back here, you'll see that the audit is, um, is really all, right? It's through the organization. It's a full investigation but an inspection is specific, right? So if you are inspecting a forklift, you are inspecting just the forklift. You are not inspecting cranes, you are not inspecting vehicles like the normal cars and trucks, but you are inspecting forklift, right? Likewise, um, you can think of it like if someone was inspecting the workshop area or perhaps the, um, the welfare facilities the audit then is more refined, sorry, the inspection is more refined to an area or to a piece of equipment if you are doing an inspection. It's formally inspected by a team or a person. Inspections are more frequently conducted than audits. Um, you can just think about that, like it may be possible to inspect the forklift every day, but then the audit may be the subject, sorry, the forklift may be the subject of an audit maybe once a year, right? But every day then, um, if we go back to the welfare facilities, every day the safety could inspect the welfare facilities, right? So inspections are much more frequently conducted than audits themselves, right? They allow time for everyone to discuss health and safety matters, including the staff who can point out any problems they have it allows for the introduction of any new steps that have to be taken as a result of new legislation and doing things like, um, well, any one of these inspections or audits, because they are both proactive, they demonstrate positive safety culture, right? So um, here's where I want to go down to the part on audit and inspection and do that table for you all. Now, when I do that, it's going to also wrap up session 13. So what I'm saying, read something on your own. It's very simple, right? I can just mention it a bit, all right? Like uh, stuff that is sampled is like water, a water sample, right? Something is not really good for safety, but I think um, like if you were sampling for things like dust and noise, sampling can work as well, right? They say it's like checking 
a reasonable number of items in a batch to confirm how good or not the batch is, right? Um, of course, that should not really be done for safety. Um, but uh, I guess I, I want to go back to my to my um, to my dust example then, right? I give you something for dust, and you have two workshops. The, the both workshops are doing the same type of work. You can sample in one workshop. And when I mean sample here, for those who know that this is also a part of safety, there are companies that do things like dust sampling. Uh, Rose, R-O-S-E comes to mind. Rose Environmental is one of them. But you have to pay them. It's about maybe $3,000 to get you know, some of these samples done. So what I'm saying is that if you sample one workshop and it turns out to be like a high concentration of some sort of dust then, right? Um, what I'm saying with the idea of sampling, it's like checking that one workshop and then assuming that the other one is also going to be dusty as well. That's what they call sampling, right? It's like checking a reasonable number of items, but I don't like this for safety because we don't really do this for safety, right? We don't really check, um, you know, like if you bought something then, right? Like you, you should check it. So this example here is really not fit into safety. It's probably more fit into something else, maybe stock taking or something, right? But it's not really fit in for safety and safety supply. So I would prefer my dust example that you, you check one workshop and if that one is dusty, you assume the other one is dusty because it's the same type of work, right? Surveys, as you know, um, some of you all have all done this via questionnaires. A survey will examine one particular aspect, for example, like PPE. So you can ask workers, but maybe with a questionnaire, like, do you uh, believe that the PPE is important? Yes or no? Do you find it's comfortable? So this is a survey, right? You can do this for a lot of stuff. I have PPE and fire here. You can do this for things like manual handling, um, pain, uh, you know, like ask workers, you know, like, uh, do you suffer from back pain? So this is a survey and it's normally done via a questionnaire. Tours are very simple. Tours is an unplanned walk. We call this like a walk around the company. It's an unplanned inspection that it's conducted at any time, quick and easy to organize, et cetera. And it could give you an idea of what is really taking place. But as I mentioned, I just kind of said these three a bit fast because they are not quite the, the basics of your studies, right? So inspections, back to inspections here. I'll go a little faster now, right? So inspections, um, initially the inspection frequency should be proportional to the perceived level of risk. What does that mean? The higher the risk, the more you should inspect. The frequency of inspection should evolve over time as a result of knowledge gain about risk from the previous ones. Inspection frequency should actually conform to the law as well. There are some laws that tell you when to inspect. Right, so if you look at the heading here, how do you know how frequent to inspect? Uh, the high number of risk, if risk is high, you need to inspect more. If you have a lot of breakdowns, I'm talking about this one here, maybe there's a piece of equipment that is known to break down, you need to do more inspections on that. Also the law tells you when to inspect, right? If you know about um, any lifting equipment, lifting equipment must be inspected once every six months if it's used to move persons, for example, like the elevator at the mall, and um, if it's used to move equipment, it must be inspected every year. How do we know that? Because the laws said that there's a law called LOLA, lifting operation, lifting equipment regulation, normally say that. And this, um, this LEV system here, there's a law for this in the UK called COSH, uh, which is an acronym, by the way. Um, you don't have to know any of these. Um, and cost requires that LEV systems be inspected once every 14 months. You don't have to know none of that. The point is the law will tell you then like when to inspect, right? Um, so let's move on. Uh, again, I'm gonna break this down. So the person doing the inspection should be competent. They should be trained. They should have knowledge. They should have a good rapport with the workforce. They must have good communication and writing skills. Now, typically, in Inspections normally use a checklist, but I suppose they will still need to talk to workers to tell them, you know, um, if you're doing an inspection, you know, like uh, when last was the forklift 
service, etc. So you still need to, some sort of writing and communication skills, but typically uh, inspections would use a checklist. If you're, um, of course, I know the, you know, the pandemic is still on, but uh, folks who have been to Subway and stuff, or even those favorite restaurants, you'll see like when the restaurant would have done an inspection of the facility and they normally have the inspection um, card tagged, um, you know, like, like in the facility or just close to where the customers may be at anyway, right? So um, most of it would actually be qualitative, like yes or no, what is the condition of the tires, good or bad? Uh, some may have a, a quantitative scoring system. The bottom line, though, is that inspections normally use as outcomes of the inspection. You normally come up with, with corrective actions, and these must be uh, remedied, and the management must, you know, hold those persons responsible. So a typical um, inspection report, if you're writing it up, would, be, would have a title page, summary, content list, introduction, main body, conclusion, recommendation, appendices, and references if you're writing up a report on the inspection that you did anyway, right? Um, again, all of these now are straight on the PowerPoint, right? Or on the book. Um, again, these used to be questions before, what is the format of a, you know, like what will be the format of a good report on an inspection, but these things are just open for you all now anyway, right? So um, let me get to the 13th lesson. I told you that I wanted to sort of tie in, um, the chart here that talks about um, the difference between, sorry there, I think I moved something that I wasn't supposed to do. Um, right, I'm trying to get this out of the way. Yeah, I'll try to tie in here the audits and the inspections. I think we already covered some though. Um, for example, the audits are holistic, right? The, my, screen and stuff is not moving the way I wanted to do this morning, right? Everything seems to be a bit haywire, right? But um, it, it is moving, but not in the time that I am moving it in. It seemed to be, again, like last week, a couple of seconds delayed. Um, could you all just verify if you all have seen session 13? You could probably not, but the screen is frozen, so I wouldn't see if you're not in. So somebody could just unmute the mic and let me know if you all have seen session 13. Yeah, we've seen it. I'm okay, seeing great. it. Okay, thanks, right? Yeah. So yes, me... sir, I'm seeing it. Okay, thanks very much, right? All right, so um, let me try to get this one to go. My cursor is still um, rotating there, so... Right, so I was saying um, this lesson then have a little bit more auditing in it, but, um, you know, the, the thing is, is that uh, we were looking at the difference between an audit and an inspection. Um, so if you can try to just line this up here for you all. This is all saying the role of senior management. They must be involved. This is obvious in the inspection and the audit, right? Um, all of this again, right? So audited here, we have already mentioned about audit says that uh, they are conducted um, annually. Just waiting for the page to respond, right? Um, they reveal the strengths and weaknesses of the organization, right? Um, it may be good public relation for your stakeholders if you do good on your audit, but a lot of companies do anyway. I mean, all those companies that are still certified or ISO certified, and in the case of schools, you know, um, with ACTT, right? I mean, those things go down well for, uh, in this case, students, or in the case of companies, um, you know, stakeholders, right? It helps you to benchmark against the standard that you are using, if it's two or ISO, or I suppose, the accreditation council um, standards anyway, right? So let me just try to get the top zoom bar here a bit out of the way, if I can get it to go. Right, so yeah, the, so the heading here is the audit methodology. And um, I, I wish you all could probably write this down because we'll go faster, right? So what, what this is saying is that if you had to do an audit, what are some things you need to get, you know, yourself organized with, right? If you had to do an audit, how would you prepare that, right? So I'll take some from this slide, but I very much feel I may just do the rest on this slide. 
So in terms of preparing for an audit, what they're saying is that you need to meet with your managers. And uh, if you are going to, and again, this is how audits are done, is either you do it internally or someone comes to your company or you go to another company to get it done. Um, and again, if you're really young and safe, you might not quite understand that, but, um, but you can think of it then like from the energy chamber, if a company wanted to be still certified, the auditors will be coming from the energy chamber, you know. Um, so what they need to do is meet with the company manager. Now, typically this may be done over a phone call. They'll have to just talk to the manager and say, you know, um, we would be planning to be at your compound, um, you know, like two weeks from now. And you do have to tell them because, you know, some people think that, um, that that's a wrong thing in telling them. But you do have to tell the company because um, you don't want to show up there, especially for things like stew, right? Um, if I can get these things to move back, stew and ISO, um, these things are voluntary, right? Stew is a voluntary management system. ISO is also voluntary, meaning the company would have spent monies then, right? With ISO, it's about 20,000 TT. Uh, this was supposed to be a S. I guess you get the idea, right? And with stew, it could be a wrong. Uh, 15,000 TT. So when the auditors come in, they have to like let the managers know then, right? So they organize the date and the time. They organize what will be audited on certain days. So they, so there may be more than one day. So they organize like what they want to see. So when they come, those documents are organized for them then. So if you want to get this put a little ticket, like they would organize, sorry, um, Yes, sorry, yes, they actually would organize. So they would organize their folder with the HSE policy in it. They'll organize their risk assessment folder because that's, that's what the auditor are coming to see, right? That's supposed to be RE there. Looks like a key, right? But it should be RE, right? So they organize the risk assessment folder, the HSE policy folder, maybe the job description of the employees, right? Et cetera, right? I don't want to spend too long there. The point is they'll organize what they're coming to do they'll actually say who they want to audit as well, right? So how auditors would be involved, they may ask you for three persons and uh, the safety may be in that, but they may want to talk to somebody from the, I'll put HSC here again, you can write as I go, or as I say it anyway. The point is though you have to organize yourself, right? So plan what procedures, processes and documents will be observed, plan what evidence you want to see to help judge compliance, right? So let, 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 I guess, let me try to clear this slide because remember the slide wouldn't um, move when, once we pull the marker, right? Um, but I was gonna give you some more there, right? But, but that's the idea that if you're going to do an audit, you plan the day, the time, you talk to the managers, plan who you wanna see. Let me see what the other slide have. If it do have what I'm looking for, I'll just give it right there, right? So you need a methodology to collect the data, to analyze the data, to represent the data, the methodology can be qualitative and quantitative. The auditor needs to be competent to make the right judgment. And typically auditors have a degree. For in-house auditing, the auditor should audit the, an area that they are not directly involved with to achieve objectivity. So let me just give you um. Right, this, so these are all skills of the auditor, right? Need good listening skills good rapport, listen to the interviewee's opinion, et cetera, right? So let me just give you then some other things that I think I could probably fit in right on this slide here. And it's very simple, right? I don't want to give any complicated ones. I'll give you maybe two complicated ones and two simple ones. Try this, I can give you up to about five, right? Some other things I need to be prepared with, right? So the slide we just read, and of course I can't go forward now, the one that said you need a method to record, that is something you need to plan. You need to plan like um, you need to plan like what standard you're using then, right? Uh, for want of a better phrase, you need to plan the questions that you're going to ask. And you would have probably have this down on a sheet of paper, which is why I mentioned the standard. If you want auditor, you need to plan the questions you're going to ask. You can't wait to go on the compound and then decide, you know, like sort of scratching your head, like what what you wanted to ask, right? Typically how it's done, these procedures here would have been sent to the auditor before, and the auditor would have um, reviewed them and pull out the question they want to ask, right? 
So you want to plan the questions that you want to ask. Just think about it a bit. Yes, you plan the date, the time, and, and everything like that. If you get down there, then what is your first question? What is your second question? What is your third question? Right? Um, so these things have to be written down. Um, you also want to uh, determine when you're going to do an audit, like what score you're going to give the questions. Because in an audit, you may have heard people mention that you have to pass the audit. What this means then is that the question you ask will carry a mark, like 20 marks. Right, so like, do you have an HSE policy? And if they have, and you review it and it's okay, you give them 20 marks, right? If they don't, maybe they have one and it's um, it hasn't been updated for the last three years, you can give them eight marks out of the 20. This is how an audit go. So you have to plan your score then based on what they say. You have to know then like how much marks is that question worth? If it was the question on the risk assessments, right? How much mark is the question worth? Then you also have to plan what is the passing grade for the audit. So these are the three complicated ones as mentioned in here, right? You have, to, you have to plan the passing grade. In that, you have to tell the company, well, you all have to get, could I put passing score instead, right? You will have to get 70% uh, and over in this audit to pass the audit, or is it 50%? So you have to plan that, right? If it's an internal audit, by the way, if it's an external audit, like so, I think I see somebody got knocked off there. Let me just check. Um, sorry, that would be participants. Hold on a bit. Uh, someone seemed to have been trying to join Jeffrey. Right, yeah, so you have to, um, if it's an internal audit, you plan the score. If it's something like STO, they already have a, a score. The score is 75, I believe, for STO, right? So um, see if you get that there. In addition to the date, the time, and what will be audited, and who you want to talk to, you need to plan your questions so it don't look like, you know, um, you're making it up on the spot. People don't really do that. Um, or you get the standard and you ask the questions from the standard. And that's what I said here. Before I said question, I said standard. You need to plan the score for the questions, the passing grade. And I'll give you three simple ones now. So some simple things you need to plan, just to make it five again. You need to plan things like um, PPE. Remember, if you're going to do a safety audit, you are probably... But I guess I could write it. I don't know what happened to the market here. Seemed to have faded out of existence, right? <laughs> so PPE, remember, um, I suppose like, like me, um, I am not in PPE throughout the course of my day, but if I'm going to do an audit or going to a company, I would normally have to just get my, well, I have them in the car in fact, right? My hard hat and my safety boots and my safety glasses to the back of the car anyway, right? So you really don't want to go into somebody's compound and when you reach by the gate, you know, they say PPE beyond this point and you as the auditor, now you don't have your PPE, right? So you want to get PPE for yourself. You want to plan things like welfare facilities, like where would you be having lunch? I didn't mention these are the easier ones to plan, right? Um, again, sometimes companies may be far away from the closest uh, restaurant, if we can call it that, or food source, right? Um, so if you're going down to a company, you need to plan, for example, like where would you get, you know, your washroom breaks from and what food and stuff would you be having to eat? I mentioned that because, again, if you're in audit, this may sound simple to you, but it's not. Uh, auditors normally, when they were talking to the managers here, they normally email, so if I had scratch there, they normally email um, the company like what they want to have for lunch, right? So this is something that is sort of touch and go with an auditor then, especially if you have a medical condition or the person may be like a vegetarian or whatever have you, you don't want to offer an auditor food that you know that you didn't sort of laze with the person to see what it was anyway, right? So well, fear and maybe um, a last simple one, I guess maybe, um, Well, what's coming to my mind might not be the simplest one, but something called um, the close out meeting, 
the close out meeting is something they do at the end of the audit. So you probably need to plan who needs to be in the close out meeting, right? The close out meeting is at the end of the audit, they normally ask to talk to the CEO. So you need to plan that the CEO would be available, you know, like maybe whatever the audit is finished on Tuesday at 2 p.m., whatever have you. You need the CEO to be there because you need to report, the auditor will report to the CEO what they found. Now, this is not be done by word of mouth. And um, again, if you have been in them, you know uh, that sometimes is not a nice experience. It is a good experience if the auditor said everything was okay, but um, it's not a nice experience if the auditor found a lot of faults anyway, because it's gonna be in front of your boss and it's gonna be in front of the CEO or whoever has hired you to be the safety in the company, right? So um, for what it's worth, if you're taking it down, uh, I wanna take it off and I just wanna end off with the, uh, with the difference between the audit and the inspection. We kind of have looked at it already. So if anybody is writing on anything there, uh, things to plan, question, score, person, score, PP, welfare, close out meeting, right? I'm taking it off. Anyway, it's recorded. I'm sure you all had a chance to write it faster than I anyway. Um, so the other one, do I don't, let me see if I can get a clearer page, right? I don't want to try to share the whiteboard. If I can get a clearer page, um, I would have shown you what I was talking about, the difference between the audit and the inspection. Right. Um, okay, so a page like this then would work fine for me. So what I'm saying, like a nice way to think about it um, is to possibly, you, you may want to finish this off for, for yourself. I don't think um, this late in the game, we could assign assignments. Your exam is just two weeks away, right? But a nice um, idea then, should I probably join this more in the middle, would have been to split a page. I to think of it like this, like what is the difference between an inspection and an audit, and you come up with some of the differences in them, right? Um, the December exam is uh, the December exam had audits in it, uh, and it was just straight from the slides. It was like, what is the advantage of an internal or an external audit? However, that's not the question now. That is the last thing I'm going to do today. Just to kind of wrap this up, we are seeing some of the differences between audits and inspections. Inspections are more frequently done. I guess if you could listen, because the marker is not responding to the quickness of me typing it, right? So um, inspections are more frequently done, like probably every day, because you could actually do an inspection every day, like daily. And uh, the audits are done, you know, like once every year then. Um, I was going to put annual there, right? So once every year. And um, at, at least sometimes audits can be done sometimes three years apart and stuff like that, right? So that, that's, that's what I'm talking about, the difference between an audit and an inspection, right? Uh, inspection is specific, right? Again, that was supposed to be a S, right? Inspections are specific. Please write it. Um, just trying to get some form of it here. Inspections are specific, like for example, to like to the washroom area or to like a warehouse, whereas the audit is holistic. It examines the entire system, all right? An audit is holistic. I'll put hole there, right? So some differences again is that uh, basically, um, how to say this, I guess. Um, so, excuse, I'm yes. sorry to interject. Um, I was still in here. Mm -hmm. I know I'm taking notes, I can't myself, but you were saying audits are holistic and what? So it's holistic, meaning it examines oh. all of the company's procedures. Okay, thanks. Yeah, so. like an audit to look at a whole company now, but an inspection would just be like, like the workshop or the warehouse, or maybe a piece of equipment like a forklift, but an inspection is not everything. If you inspect and you inspect in one particular aspect, as opposed to an audit looking at everything anyway. Okay. Right, yeah. All right, thank you. Yeah, no problem, no problem, Colleen. Um, so I was trying to figure out how to say this. Um, 
uh, the, the, the thing what I want to say is that an inspection can be done by an average employee. Anyone then, and that may not be fair to say, but anyone with a bit of experience then, right? So if you put it like an average employee, but you probably need to explain this, that this person may be like an educated person then. That's supposed to be AVG, right? So an average employee can take up a checklist then, which is how some people do it, right? The, an average employee, right, can take a checklist and go and look at the forklift. So in a way then, what I'm trying to say is that an inspection can be done by an average person, but an order that have to be done by like a trained professional, a consultant then. If you, if you please, you could just put the word trained professional is better, but it's easier for me just to put consultant on this slide here, right? So you would find then like in terms of the order, the consultant have a little bit more experience and knowledge and whatever have you. There's supposed to be a TA, T-A-N-T, -A consultant, right? So, the, so this is what I'm saying, the difference between an audit and an inspection, right? So uh, we, we're going again, if I can get to four, inspections tend to be very cheap. Remember, it's just a sheet of paper you're using to, to really, you know, check the warehouse and the forklift conditions and stuff, right? So you're recording that in a sheet of paper. So it's kind of economical. Uh, the, the better word than cheap, they would be economical and not cheap, right? Especially if you're writing for the UK people, right? So it's more economical but the audit is going to be more expensive. We mentioned some figures before 15,000, 20,000 and stuff. The, 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 the audit is going to be expensive, right? So you see what I'm doing? If you put your mind to it, um, again, this is supposed to be E-X-P-E-N, right? Um, please forgive the thing there, P-E-N-S-I-V-E. Expensive, and I think I get to the idea that like when I put it like this, how you could you get the difference between an audit and an inspection? It's so they put your mind to it and you can get them, right? Um, so maybe one last one here for me is that an inspection does not have a lot of documents. It's like one document to be looking at, or one or two documents. One document, for example, you'll be looking at the forklift then alone. You can look at more than one, but the idea is that you use that, that in an inspection, you look at less documents, whereas an audit, you look at more documents. It's more comprehensive. It's a more comprehensive document search then or review. Again, those are the better words to put, right? It's a more comprehensive um, document review, right? So the auditor may ask to see then risk assessments for the last three months. So it's more comprehensive, a more comprehensive look at documents um, in itself, right? More comprehensive document review. So this, like I said, this is what I'm saying that um, difference between audits and inspections. If, if you were to think of it like this, um, again, though, I, I have mentioned that um, with this exam, you can use your book, you could use Google and stuff, but we have just put our mind state here and we came up with about five anyway, differences between audits and inspections. I'm, I'm sure five is good and you can build on that five if you think about it and you understand now that an, that an audit is just like, well, holistic, right? It's a whole company. Um, and again, that could be a point there. Like for example, the, 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 uh, the inspection may just look at one interviewee Whereas the audits may look at, you know, more than one person to be interviewed then, right? So if you do it like that, I think you can come up with the answers. But also, as mentioned for the second time now, that Google is, you know, a source of information. You can simply type these things on Google and you'll get the difference between audit and inspections, right? So the last thing for me today, um, well, the last content work I'm trying to push, right? The last thing was this, right? Um, let me go back now. They have here two types of audits. So we, are, so we are away from the question we just looked at, right? So the difference between audits and inspections, I would have done that there. This now is saying that there are two types of audits. As some of you know, an internal audit is conducted by your own employees or your own self. And some, some advantages and disadvantages of, of that is listed here. 
as well as if you have an external auditor, right? So the advantage of using your own employees is that the employees will get a sense of involvement and ownership in the company. The organization could learn about itself before anybody else from the outside come in and see what's wrong. The team will know its business and its workforce better than anybody else. The disadvantage of using your own employees is that it can be subjective rather than objective, meaning that um, the CEO or some body in management can say to you, when you're doing the internal audit, do not look at the accident that happened last week. Let's forget that, right? That was a contractor. Let's forget that because that would make us look bad, right? It could be um, leading towards company, polit uh, company politics. And if you have done any of these, one of the main disadvantages of using internal persons is that the, the sorry, the, 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 the people that you're using. Now, these people are normally accountants and technicians and operation managers and stuff, right? So a lot of the times they just do it because they had to do it. Maybe some in the company had them, you know, roster to do an internal audit, but they will have their own work to do, right? So most of the times, internal people, because an operation manager or an accountant have her work to do then, right? They will just get this done in the most menial way. So they don't have time to do a good job. And if you want another one right here, there's another disadvantage is that the accountant and the operation managers are not really trained auditors. Right? So again, I'm talking from experience that I don't have time to share. And plus the course is not all about that anyway. But when we do train people for this, you find that um, even if you train an operation manager or an accountant to do a safety audit, they just do it menially then because they had to do it. They don't fully understand, like an accountant may not fully understand a risk assessment. So if he or she doesn't understand a risk assessment, how could they audit a risk assessment? Right? But this is how it is. This is what an internal audit is. You use your own employees to do the audit, um, to try to find what is going wrong. Most of the times, for those who have done that, what is wrong is the audit itself because the people did not do a good audit. All right? They just did it because they had to do it. So internal audits are good though, especially if you have a, um, like a quality department. Um, if you have a quality department, it means that somebody in the company is trained in audits and they can do the, the quality manager then can do some internal audits and it's better than having the employees do it who may not be trained as, um, as auditors, right? So we have um, the external audit slide. Once I could get it to go because I clicked it already, external audits. You, you get an objective view, you have a team of specialists and you benchmark against a higher standard. External audits are like what I do. Right? The disadvantage is that the person may be unfamiliar with the organization. That is true. You can get communication barriers if you do not work for the company, but most of the times people are willing to talk to you once you have good communication skills. Right? Let me go back to the top. Objective view, meaning that this person that is coming to do the external audit, trying to find the cursor, right? That person is not really working for you. Um, you have paid them to do a job and so that if something is wrong, then they will tell you it wrong, right? They will tell you that it's wrong, right? And, and one of my, um, but I always remember this one. I remember a lot though, but again, this is the one that's in my head now. Um, I remember doing an external audit for a company, a store audit. And, uh, you know, we had agreement and stuff. Let me just admit. Some people may have been bumped out. Right, I remember doing an audit for a company. I was saying, and um, just a long story short, um, we had agreement and everything, uh, but it turned out that um, the company was not a registered company. It, it was not like in the company's registry then, right? Um, so they had this big sign, um, you know, try not to mention the name of the place, but they had this big sign with, you know, huge signs and logos and coveralls and stuff, but the company was not registered. And just the end of the story here, um, because I said that, it it sort of said, send the snowball then, rolling 
that would have ended that company because um, there were a lot of partners and stakeholders involved. It was like a group of companies that was forming. And when the partners and them found out that they, they pulled out, so the company today is no longer existing, right? And it, it was um, on the river that road there, huge signs. I don't know if the signs are still up, right? But to tell you that um, external persons then, you know, are not afraid to tell you how things are anyway, right? Um, I want to add one here. I think, um, I think a disadvantage of an external person is that is that they are more costly, right? Typically, auditors work for like about three thousand dollars for the day, right? So a disadvantage of using an external person is going to be more expensive than using your own staff. But then with an external audit, you can be certified the things like STO or ISO. Or in the case of schools, you know, ACTT, but um, you know, it is going to be a bit more expensive, right? So the lesson is finished there. I think um, we did a fair job there of uh, breaking down a lot of refined details in addition to reading this slide, right? I broke down things like a uh, difference between audits and inspections and stuff. See if you have any questions. I'm attempting to show you something behind the scene. If I am not successful, I guess you would know, right? See if you have any questions, remember, um, Next week would probably be our last week, which I think it is the last week in January before the exam. We have one lesson to go. I know you saw 13 and it is really 15 lessons, but um, uh, 14 and 15 is the same thing, kind of like how 13, 12 and 13 here was the same thing anyway. Right, just bear with me a bit. Um, again, in the meantime, think if, if you have any questions, I wanted to share. All right, I'm going to stop the recording. This is what I was telling you about because something's here. Um.